Yeah. Are we expecting anyone else to be coming in? Oh, I guess we're, yeah. Being recorded, okay. I guess we can uh, get started. And uh, like to welcome Chris Cormack. And uh, like I said before, for those who uh, are just tuning in, I met Chris two years ago to the date, September 8th, 2019. He gave a talk at uh, Toronto Field Naturalist downtown. And uh, at that time, the uh, Meadow Way was very new. Nobody seemed to know much about it. So I thought this would be an ideal topic for us because it's, you know, takes on a lot of Scarborough. And uh, so, of course, we booked two years ago. And with like all other speakers, or less, it's, uh, it's taken two years of rebooking, and he's finally here. And uh, Chris, in his own words, he's happy to spread the word about the Meadow Way, and it's at no cost to us. And so I think please welcome Chris Cormack. Thank you very much, Annette. I really appreciate it. Um, looking forward to spending the next hour or so with you, uh, giving you a little introduction to the Meadow Way and the, the type of work that we're doing uh, throughout the corridor. Um, so today's talk, we're going to be looking at the Meadow Way, which is the project running through Scarborough, the hydro corridor that runs all the way from the Don River, all the way out to about where the zoo is connecting to the Rouge Park. Uh, so this project is something that's been going on for quite some time at a smaller scale, but starting a couple of years ago has really ramped up into a larger scale project. Um, just before I even get started, how many people have actually been through the Meadow Way before? Yeah, I see some hands waving. Okay, that's good. Um, so at least some of you are familiar with it. Uh, if you're not familiar with it, uh, I will give you some ideas of good places to go and good places to check out. Uh, and sort of give you an explanation of what the Metaway is and where it's going and, and what's going to become with it. Um, so just a quickly about myself, I'm uh, the site supervisor with uh, Toronto Conservation Authority um, doing the restoration work for the Metaway project. Uh, I've been in this role for almost three years now. And uh, meaning I get to be on site most days. Uh, I've got a, a crew of about eight people working under me, uh, transforming that hydro corridor into the Meadow Way. Um, so if at any time through the presentation, if you do have any questions, I'll have lots of time at the end. Uh, if you have any really burning questions you wanna ask right away, just feel free to jump in. Don't worry about bothering and interrupting me. I don't mind. Um, but we will also have time for questions at the end. Okay, so um, the Meadow Way. So I'm gonna quickly go through uh, sort of, this is our outline for what I'm gonna talk about, a brief intro to what conservation authorities are, uh, the benefits of revitalizing the corridor, uh, a pilot project called the Scarborough Center Butterfly Trail, uh, and then get into actually the Meadow Way, what the goals are, how we do the restoration work, how we select our seed and adaptive management, um, the monitoring, and how you can help the pollinators and how you can also grow your own pollinator garden. I'm sure a lot of you are already doing that. So Toronto Conservation Authority. So what is a conservation authority? So basically we are a natural resource management agency and we're mandated by the government to do restoration, development, and manage Ontario's natural resources. And conservation authorities started way back in the 50s after some very bad weather, not too different from yesterday's big storm, but a little bit heavier, that caused a lot of flooding. And so that flooding introduced the idea of putting together conservation authorities. And we work at a watershed-based um, sort of broad scale so the Toronto Conservation Authorities covers uh, a number of watersheds all the way from the West End at the Humber, all the way down to the East End over near um, the Oshawa boundary and as far north as Uxbridge and Caledon. So it's quite a large area. 
Uh, so we're one of 36 conservation authorities in Ontario. We have over 400 full-time employees. We have up to 3,000 volunteers on a, any given year. Now, obviously, the last two years have been a little different, but we'll be getting back into that over the next uh, next while, hopefully. Uh, so we've covered a, a total of nearly 3,500 square kilometers of area. So it's quite a large footprint that we manage. And we focus on the flood and erosion control, recreation, education, watershed preservation, development and planning and stewardship. So the Metaway project itself has a lot of those individual things. So recreation, education, watershed preservation, these are all important parts of the Metaway project. So this map, I don't know uh, if you can see that cursor. Can you guys see the cursor? Just give me a wave if you see it. Just a little arrow there. Yeah, okay, perfect. So I can point to things if I need to. Uh, so this, this outer boundary, this is the TRCA's jurisdiction. So you can see it's quite a large area, it covers most of the, the greater Toronto area. And then right here, this red line, this is the Meadowway. So it is a substantially, uh, a substantial project. It covers a good portion of the east end of, uh, east end of Toronto, running all the way through Scarborough. Um, and a couple of interesting things to note is if you look at all the waterways, the green corridors, they all run kind of in a north-south direction. And there's really no east-west linkage between any of those green spaces until we draw that metaway line. And that metaway line now connects a whole bunch of watersheds and natural corridors. So it cr will create a nice natural corridor linking the different waterways, which are where most of the green space uh, will occur. So why are we doing the Metaway project? Well, we started because we have these utility corridors and we have that utility corridor, the Gatineau Hydro Corridor running through Scarborough that up until a few years ago looked like these images, just mowed grass. Um, the grass is cut seven times a year using a lot of resources, a lot of expense, uh, burning a lot of fossil fuels to run those tractors to cut all this grass all this time. Um, it's all thick non-native grass, uh, meaning it's not originally from here. Um, it's got low biodiversity. It doesn't have the greatest in terms of aesthetics. There's no flowers. It's just a green lawn but it's not even a manicured lawn. It's actually very full of weeds. It's full of invasive species. Um, so by continuing to mowing it, it looks like a lawn, but it, if you let it grow, it does come up with a lot of invasive species such as dog strangling vine. And the interesting thing is we have nearly 500 kilometers of these corridors in the Toronto area. So there's a representation of where a lot of these corridors are. So if we're thinking long-term, this project, although it is, seems really big, it is only 16 kilometers long. And that's this stretch over here, running from the Rouge down to the Don. But we do have all these other corridors that are potential for additional restoration work and turning them into naturalized meadows. So this is what the corridor looks like. Well, this is what it looked like in 1975, actually. It hasn't changed much. So it's mowed turf. There's actually a few milkweeds popping up here if you look carefully. But other than that, it's mowed turf and it's been like that for the past 45 years. It's truly an untapped potential. So this is looking, it gives you a real idea of the scale from a helicopter photo. You can see downtown in the background, but there's that strip of green running all the way through. And up until we started the project, this green was just mowed grass. Uh, the trail going through here, that was one of the first steps as part of the project. And that will be extended. And that's part of our job is to make sure that we get that trail connected all the way from the Dawn, all the way up to the Rouge. So eventually you'll be able to walk, bike, just go for a, a stroll through nature all the way 
connecting all the way downtown out to the Rouge. And that's is potentially what it could look like, right? So we've got the trail system, you've got your wires overhead still, but you have all this natural meadow, wildflowers, and of course the pollinators. So why are we restoring these areas? No, not because we don't like grass. I mean, I have nothing against grass, but there's a lot more benefit to restoring it to a natural wildflower meadow in terms of increasing biodiversity, uh, increasing the natural cover for wildlife. Uh, already we see all kinds of more small animals. We see deer even down in the corridor. Um, it'll decrease maintenance costs eventually. Okay, now that's not to say there is a lot of work to get it going, but once it becomes established, it will take a lot less maintenance. We'd be mowing it every three, four years instead of seven times a year. It'll contribute to the habitat linkages and movement of animals. So as I was saying before, there's the north-south pattern of all the rivers and natural corridors will now have an east to west linkage. So there'll be a lot more movement for allowing natural corridor. Um, restoring the into a meadow will improve water infiltration. Having the natural uh, meadow have a wildflowers with much, much deeper root systems than say a uh, grass turf. So by having those deeper roots, there's much more potential for water to be uptaken. So that will redu reduce and improve water quality, improve water quality, and reduce potential chances of flooding. Uh, it'll also provide environmental education opportunity for the community. Uh, I'll show you a, a photo a little bit later on, but there's a lot of schools that back right onto the corridor, and by having them back right onto the corridor there's all kinds of potential for those school kids to use that space for education. They do, a lot of them end up walking through the corridor to get to school every day. So just being in the more wild area for them uh, gives them much more potential for interaction with nature. So reimagining the utility corridor. So this is where it all started with this pilot project the Scarborough Center Butterfly Trail. And this started in about 2011, 2012, and was originally sort of the pilot that then became the Meadow A. So it started with a three and a half kilometer section of the Gatineau Corridor between Brimley and Scarborough Golf Club Road. So if any of you have been into this section, uh, this section is the most developed now because it has been uh, seeded for at least three to five years. Um, most of the meadow areas have come up very well. There is a lot of wildflowers. There's a lot of natural native grasses uh, and the area looks amazing. Um, so before 2011, it looked like the photo down on the bottom left, which was just grass turf. And the reintroduction of the meadow after three years shows what it looks like in the middle photo. So that's from the same, almost the same angle. So that's literally the same spot before and after three years later. Okay. It also improves user experience by incorporating the trail system along with it. So it allows you all to have better access to actually go through and enjoy the space as well. So this is a little bit of a, a sky view picture of uh, some of the key features that we're looking for. And one obviously is the trail that goes through. So working with the city of Toronto um, and Hydro One to develop this trail system that's gonna link all the way through, uh, that gives us the access into the area. We've got our restored meadow. So this would be a little bit later in the season, maybe end of August where there's a lot of yellow coming out. Uh, right now, there's a lot of tall sunflower, a lot of goldenrods have also just started blooming out there. So there is a, a quite a yellow hue to it right now. Earlier in the season, there was a lot more of the purples were out as well with uh, a lot of the bergamot, for example, uh, being in bloom. Uh, as I mentioned, there's a lot of school grounds that back right onto the corridor. So this school, for example, 
If you look really carefully right from the corner of their yard, you can see there's actually a trail that goes right along the edge of the meadow there. And that's where quite literally hundreds of kids every day walk through the meadow, cut right along the edge of the meadow and into their school every day. So it really does get a lot of interaction from school kids and a lot of the schools do use the space to help with their teaching. Uh, as well, the TRCA education group has um, uh, classes in, that go into the school and work with the students. They teach them about the meadow restoration. They grow little plants uh, in the classroom and then they have opportunities later where they actually come out and plant them into the meadow way as well. Uh, <coughs> pardon me. Of course, that's been a little bit uh, shut down over the last year, but it's going to be up and running again soon. Uh, some other interesting things are the cross crossings at the roads. So part of the whole trail design is figuring out how to make those crossings safe. So on very small roads like this one here, this happens to be Daventry. Uh, it's a very uh, low flow road. So rather than putting a full crosswalk with traffic lights, they just put the mid block crossing, meaning they've changed the pavement color. They put it into uh, cobblestone so the drivers obviously know that there is something coming up with the signage um, for the crossing. Uh, the more major roads, they actually are putting traffic light crossings in. Um, in this particular area, there's also the allotment gardens. And we have right now three different sets of allotment gardens that have been incorporated as part of the Meadowway, uh, all the way from down in the West End at Jonesville, uh, at the Givendale Gardens at Kennedy, and the Daventry Road Gardens here. And then another key feature is this buffer strip. So if you look, we have left a little bit of mow turf and we leave this mow turf around the perimeter, uh, particularly along the back of property lines. And that's about a five meter wide strip of mowed grass. And the same thing along the sides of the trail. So along the trail is important for sight lines because if you're cycling, for example, you don't want to have tall vegetation right to the edge of your trail where you can't see around a corner. So we keep the we keep the trail mowed short for about three and a half meters on either side. And around the property lines gives uh, the property owners that back onto this area uh, a way to still exit through their back because a lot of them have back gates that opened up into the corridor so they can open, uh, come out their back gate and still have access to go around the, into the meadow. Plus it also gives us an opportunity to prevent uh, movement of invasive species because we there are a lot of invasive species in the Toronto area as you may know uh, so we really try and reduce the amount of movement so by having that mode strip it, it helps to reduce the amount of movement from people's backyards into the meadow and vice versa so because this Scarborough Center butterfly trail was so successful uh, we wanted to expand it and that's when the Meadowway became the Meadowway. So the whole concept of the Meadowway is to have a community powered green space. So this is creating this linkage, as I mentioned, east to west, where the community can be really involved, have connections, have access, have, use it as a transportation link, use it for recreation, um, and also for education. So all of these uh, features are really key fundamental pillars of the whole project. Uh, and are all sort of incorporated into all of the designing and planning for the project. So at the end of the day, uh, when we have finished com and completed the, the work for the metal restoration, we're going to be looking at over 16 kilometers of corridor that will be restored. And it will link all the way from Toronto and all the way out to the Rouge. So again, there's a, the overhead view and, and the scale of what the Meadowway is running all the way, connecting all this green space in the Rouge through all of these river corridors here, all the way down to the Don River. So part of the planning side of things was a uh, municipal class uh, EA that was done. And this was in order to um, put the design for the remaining six kilometers of multi-use trail. Uh, 10 kilometers of trail already exists through the corridor, but another six were needed to, to actually connect it all together. 
uh, along with a number of potential bridge crossings. So the whole EA proce process was completed uh, beginning of last year. Uh, and now they're still in the design and implementation phase. There's a bridge at um, Ellesmere Marine, uh, sorry, Highland Creek, which is currently under construction and will uh, allow the trail to continue from Scarborough Golf Club Road all the way down to Nielsen Road. So that section is expected to be under construction for the next year or so. And then a little farther east at the Ellesmere Ravine, this the top right picture is what it looks like currently, and the bottom picture is what it could look like. Uh, these are some sort of uh, artist renditions of what the, the bridge design could be across that ravine, uh, again, with the trail continuing all the way along in the background. Uh, now, this is still early in the planning phases for this bridge uh, and this whole section. Um, I don't expect this will be anywhere near starting completion or starting construction for at least another year. So where we start is with our concept plan. Uh, so this is a, an example of our concept plan for section one. Uh, and what I didn't mention is we've broken this, the meta way down into seven sections running from west to east. So. Uh, section one runs just from the, the end of the Don River, sort of the, at the top of the, uh, the, the, the slope up from the riverbank, all the way down to um, Pharmacy Avenue. Section two runs from Pharmacy to Kennedy and so on. So this is from a portion of section one uh, between Bermondsey and Eglinton here. Uh, and so what you see is the sort of the hazier light green areas, and that's all areas where we have uh, established meadow footprint, meaning we've gone in and planted wildflowers and native grasses. The brighter green are where shrubs are planted. Uh, so we do uh, work with the city of Toronto and their forestry group, and they do all the shrub planting. And the shrub planting is done with a specific um, list of species that are approved by Hydro One that are not gonna to grow too tall because one of the main constraints we have in the Hydro Corridor is not planting anything that's gonna to grow too tall and could impact uh, with the wires or become a hazard. So safety is of utmost concern when we're working on this type of a project because we are in the utility corridor. Um, but that being said, putting in a meadow makes perfect sense because the meadow is not gonna to grow too tall, nor is it gonna start growing large trees. Uh, additionally, access is still maintained because you can drive a truck through a meadow if you need to. So if, for example, hydro needs to get to one of the towers, which are the, these circles here, they can drive through the meadow and access that tower if they need to. So we're maintaining the corridor but into a natural state without obstructing the use of the corridor itself in terms of a utility corridor still. Um, so a few other little features that we look at when we're looking at the planning is we look at monitoring plots. So we do have monitoring that's done throughout the corridor and we try and have a monitoring plot set up and that's our, um, our ecologists and biologists come out twice a year and monitor these plots uh, for a whole variety of things. Um, we look at the buffers around all the towers, that's the dotted lines. So they, we have a 15 meter buffer around all the towers where we don't plant any shrubs because they don't want any woody material close to a tower um, or any signposts or anything like that as well. Uh, we also have signs that are put in, uh, those with the little red dots, little red S's are along the, the trail line there. And signs are really important because that helps people understand what is happening on the site. Otherwise, they just show up and are like, where'd the grass go? And they're very confused. So by putting the signage in, it really helps. So this would be a nice cross section of what we'd be trying to establish in, in a meadow. So we would have some wetter areas, so a little bit deeper wetter areas, which were you know, better for some of the wetter species of uh, wildflowers. 
Um, we would put in some sentinel stones. We'd put in some hibernacula potentially, some nest boxes, um, some habitat woody piles, which allow you know more uh, space for small animals. Um, now this is in a in a perfect meadow typical cross section. Uh, that said, within the hydro corridor, because of restrictions due to safety and due to access, we can't put things like the sentinel stones, the woody debris piles, or the hibernacula in because it would potentially be a hazard if uh, work crews accessing a tower or driving through with a vehicle and they might run into one of these. So within the meadow way, we stick to the meadow species itself we do put some nest boxes in in some places uh, but those are tall enough that you can see them uh, above the meadow itself but we don't put any logs or stones or things like that in uh, at the moment okay so why why do this really i mean this is the bit the important part really is the benefit of all these meadows for pollinators uh, I'm sure as a garden club, as a garden group, horticultural society, you are all very, very familiar with pollinators and how pollinators are slowly disappearing in places and how we need to have more of them and how important they are for, uh, for basically all flowers and a lot of our food. Uh, very, very important for everyone, essentially. They're not just important for themselves, they're important for humans as well. Um, so in terms of creating this uh, nectar and pollen producing plants that we have throughout the meadow way, we're producing huge amounts of this nectar and pollen for these pollinators to come in. Um, many of the plants that we put in have hollow stems. Uh, and that's really important because a lot of the uh, pollinators actually use hollow stems for overwintering. They will put their eggs or their, their uh, juveniles inside the stems and that's where they'll stay for the winter. Um, and also having some bare soil. Uh, compared to a turf where it's solid grass, if you look at the meadow and you look close to the soil, there's actually still quite a bit of bare soil because these plants are not right up against each other at the base. They sort of space themselves out naturally and there will be some bare soil that will still be showing through. And a lot of pollinators do nest underground. They dig small holes and will burrow and create little burrows under the ground. So having that bare soil is important for them as well. Uh, in terms of butterflies, again, we have all these nectar producing plants. Uh, a lot of the plants that are out there are host plants. Uh, for the eggs. So I met, I'm sure you're all familiar with the monarch butterfly and the host plant being the milkweed. So there are a lot of milkweed out there, but there's also a lot of other host plants for different species of butterflies. Um, it also shelters high winds. So before the, the meadow was put in, when it's just bare turf, the wind can howl down that corridor because there's nothing to obstruct the wind. Now with the different heights of plants, um, and the different thicknesses of the vegetation, it can really reduce the actual wind speed flowing through there. Uh, as well, there's wet, muddy pockets in places, and that's where a lot of butterflies will pick up a lot of their nutrients by landing and drinking from these um, muddy pockets on the soil. There's also a lot of benefits for birds. So as I mentioned this, I, I'm going to keep mentioning it because I feel how important it is. The linkage going east to west, it also creates a place for birds to come in and not only feed, because there is a lot of uh, fruit and seed producing shrubs, um, but the grasses create nest cover. They create nesting material. There's a lot more habitat, structural habitat for them. Uh, we do put some bird boxes in, um, but the majority of the birds tend to be nesting within the vegetation or using it as a feeding source. Uh, so for a migratory stopover area, that's really important to be able to have that food source for a lot of birds. Okay, so we've talked about why it's important. Now I'll talk about how we do it. 
And it's not so easy as just stop mowing it. Because as I mentioned, there's a lot of invasive species in that grass that's currently there. So it takes a little bit more, actually a lot more effort. Um, and I can attest my crew work really, really hard to make this happen. Uh, so when we start, uh, started on a new section and I'll give you an example. We started in section one and section two uh in 2019 um section one was seeded at the beginning of 2020 uh section two was seeded at the end of 2020 uh so those sections were just done in the last year and a half um and before we started in those sections we did all of these baseline sort of assessments we do um a flora fauna survey where the monitoring group goes out and puts out their monitoring plots and sets them up. So we have a beforehand data so that moving forward, we can compare that and see how much improvement there actually is. Uh, we test the soils to make sure there's uh, no past pesticides or any strange chemicals in the ground. Uh, we look at what type of soils there. We assess what invasive species are present uh, and we map where they are to understand the extent. So if we need to do uh, more extensive um, work to remove those before we start, we know where to go. Uh, and then we create the three to five year management plan for those sections. And then we actually get in on site. And these are all examples from uh, 20, from last year. Uh, this is in section two. And some of the first things we do is we go in and we clear the site. Now, when I say clear the site, I don't mean we go and take all the trees down and remove them all. What I mean is we go down and we take out a lot of the invasive species. Uh, we do trim some of the lower branches off the trees so that we have more access to get in and around them with our machinery so that we can get in there without uh, damaging equipment. Um, but mostly it's just removing invasive species uh, and and cleaning up sort of the, the brushier stuff. Then we'll go in and we'll put the signage in. As I mentioned, the signage is really, really important. Uh, partly to brand the whole project so people understand what the project is. And part of that is what I'm doing right now is you know talking to all of you. So you guys have a really good understanding. And now that you're going to know all about the Metaway, you're going to have more chance to visit it and more chance to tell other people about it as well. So we put out this signage and the signs we actually change each year. So the, the messaging on the signs relates to the stage of where we are in the project. So at this stage, the first, uh, the first sign that goes out, uh, it explains why meadows are important because they're an endangered habitat. Uh, it explains how it's gonna look more or less like an agricultural field for a year because we're gonna be tilling it. Um, and that after the end of a year, we will actually finally put the seed in the ground. And then the second year, we put up a different sign that says this area has been seeded. You'll start to see some wildflowers, but you need to be patient because it takes time. And then once it's established, we change the sign again, saying this area has now been established as a meadow. Be prepared to see it get cut because we will come in and mow it every few years. So we change the signage so that it relates specifically to where we are in the project with that particular part. By the way, that's me in that machine. That's a really fun machine to drive. So once we get the signage up, then we begin with our first round of tilling. So we get the tractors out there and we till up the soil. Um, then we go down, we put some cover crop in and for most part we were using oats uh, oats are very easy to grow uh, cover crop they grow quickly they germinate really fast uh, and we put the cover crop in just to hold the soil to make sure that now that we've tilled it all up we don't have a big storm where it all just washes away we don't want a major erosion problem but what we do want to do is we don't we want all those seeds that are already in the ground in the soil to germinate we want those to grow because we're gonna repeat this process. So we're gonna put the cover crop in, we harrow it in either with a chain harrower or, or a packer roller and that gets the seeds incorporated nicely into the ground. And then they start to come up. So this is our oats coming up and we let it grow for maybe a month. 
and then we'll go back and we'll run the tiller right through it again. And so the process essentially is trying to remove all of the seeds that are in the seed banks. We want to let them grow. We want to let them get tilled up and remove them again. So we repeat this process uh, anywhere between three and five times, depending on how dense the invasive species are. So by the time we've done that three to five times, we end up with uh, an area that has almost no more weeds in it. So we have a nice, clean, fresh slate. Um, well, I threw this in because one thing we're always trying to do is improve our processes. So throughout the last few years, whenever we're doing uh, another step in our process, we're always trying to improve it and you know make it more efficient or make it work better. So one of the things we've been trying is changing our cover crops. So we've tried different varieties. We've used oats, we've used millet, we've used rye um, to see which ones work best to help uh, grow quickly, um, create a, a cover over the soil to prevent erosion, but still also allow all those other non-native species to come up. Um, we've also trialed how to incorporate it. So you can see here we've tried with a roller, we've tried with the rakes, we've tried different kinds of cedars. And uh, every time we do something like this, we then say, okay, well, this one works the best. So we're gonna move to that process for a while. So we're constantly trying to improve our processes. So then at the end of that first year or beginning of the second year, we will treat the cover crop. We may have to mow it if it's gotten too long. And then we'll bring in this very specialized cedar. This is a seed drill that's designed specifically for wildflowers and grasses. Um, the wildflower seeds are so small compared to most crops that you have to have a specialized piece of equipment like this one that's designed to hold those very, very small um, flower seeds. Otherwise they'll just dump out and you, you'll pile them all in one spot and they won't be distributed nicely. So this is, uh, it's pretty important to be able to use this, the right kind of uh, seed drill. Uh, we can do some of this seeding by hand. So if you're doing a smaller project, you could just hand broadcast your seed, but because we're doing about 25 hectares of area at a time, it's much more efficient to use a piece of equipment like this. So then another part, important part is where we get the seed. So we always wanna make sure we're using native seed uh, throughout this process, because we are trying to create you know, a natural native seeded meadow. So it has plants that are designed to grow here that the wildlife is already cued in to, to incorporate with and feed with uh, and, and, and work with. So making sure we're using native plants uh, from the from a local seed zone as much as possible. Now that's not always exactly possible because there are no um, no seed growers in the Toronto area that can produce as much seed as we need because we're talking hundreds of kilos of seed uh, each time we do one of these sections. So we do focus on trying to get them as close as possible, but for the most part, most of our seed comes from Southwest Ontario. Um, which are the right species. They're just not necessarily as close as we would like them. So we do get uh, a variety of different mixes. We have uh, last year, we were using five different seed mixes, depending on where we were putting our seed, whether it's a drier area, wetter area, area where there's a lot more invasive species. We have a mix that we call a resilient mix. And that's ones where it has species that will try and fight against those invasives better. They're faster growing, for example. Um, so we have five different mixes that we use with a varying composition of forbs versus grasses. So some have more wildflowers uh, to be more showy, we more flowers in bloom at a time. Other areas we prefer to have more of a grass mix. Um, now that said, it's not just grasses, it's still 30% wildflowers to 70% grass versus the ones that are heavy on the wildflowers would be 60 to 70% wildflowers, 30% grasses. 
Um, but we still want to have a nice balance and we're looking to get as many different species into that mix as we can to have the most diversity as possible. Uh, so some of the mixes have 25 to 30 different species that will be into there. Um, once we've established these meadows, we are also now starting to collect local seed from in and around the Toronto area. So we're doing that by going out to the different conservation areas, collecting some smaller amounts of seed that we're then actually incorporating into the meadow as well to get some of the local genetics into that area to try and uh, give a bump to the local genetics of those uh, wildflowers, as well as the ones that are coming in from Western Ontario. Uh, and we're looking at potentially always looking at, you know, expanding what we can do. And that means maybe looking at getting a, a small nursery where we can grow some of that local seed into potted stock that we can then use for planting events with the community. So these are a couple of the wildflower plants that we do plant out there. And just in terms of hydrology, something that's really interesting to see is their root structure and how deep they go. If you look over here on the left, you'll notice like some of these are going down three, four meters deep. So that's a real deep root structure. And, you know, essentially that gives them a lot more, um, resilience if there's a drought, for example, because they're deep root structure, especially when you look right here, where that red arrow is at the turf grass, and you look at the root structure on that, there isn't any, right? So you think, oh, well, it hasn't rained for a couple of weeks. What do I gotta do? I gotta go water my lawn because it's gonna die. And essentially it is because it, it has no roots that you know penetrate into the ground. Whereas all these wildflowers, they have roots that go down for many, several meters. So they're able to withstand those drought periods much, much better. But that also means that when they start growing, a lot of that energy that they're putting into their first year or first two years is going to their root structure. So that you don't necessarily see a lot of them come up in that first year. So that's why it's really important when we're patient with, uh, with the meadow when we first put it in. So once we put it in, then we're talking about the second year now and what's coming in, we come in with our big mowers here and we'll cut it down a little bit. We're not cutting it down flat to the ground, but we're cutting down a lot of the standing stock because what happens is it starts to shade itself out. So if you look carefully underneath the taller grass is some of the wildflowers that have started to come up. And this is particularly important when it was spring seeded as this section was. So the, this here is a black eyed Susan um this is uh showy tick so these are you know they're only a few inches tall and being shaded out by that other grass so we go through and we cut that grass down in the spring to allow more sunlight into access those plants so there's later on in that second year this would be a, another area that was uh, seed in the spring and you can start to see some of the wildflowers coming up some of the earlier ones like the black eye susan here this tall sunflower uh, but you'll also see a lot of other non-native species um, like the queen anne's lace coming in here so there always will be a lot of the weed species coming in that first year uh, and that's to be expected but as long as you have some of the wildflowers coming in a lot of the ones will still be there you just don't see them blooming because they're putting that effort into those roots. So there you have it after this on the third year, it really starts to come up because a lot of those wildflowers that you don't see the first year, first year after it's seeded. So when I say third year, this is actually the second year after it's seeded. Uh, the first year is all the prep. Um, so by this year, you're really starting to see a number of different species coming up. So you're getting some tall sunflowers over here. You're getting the bergamot. You're getting some uh, black eyed Susan. Uh, there's some sweet oxeye over in here as well. So you're getting a lot more variety coming in. And then by the fourth year, it looks like that. So this is the same location. Let me just back up one. See the bird box in the foreground there? So this is the exact same place one year later. It's 
pretty impressive how much really can pop. And so somewhere in between there, we've also done a maintenance mow. Uh, and we do that to cut back all the thatch and allow that sunlight to really get into those plants when they start to grow the following year. So they, they tend to clump up and you get the bigger plants uh, that you can see in this photo. And there's the same place in year one. So it's pretty dramatic difference. So here's a couple more sort of before and afters. This is a section in spring. So in the spring we went through and we did a mow in this section. Uh, we do that on a rotating cycle every three, three or so years to break that thatch layer up. So early summer, it's starting to come up. It's growing very quickly. Believe it or not, that is only a few months later how much taller it is. And then later in the summer, it looks like that. So this is the same spot, only a few months apart. So even though it was mowed in the spring, it fully will come up into a full wildflower meadow within that same year. And then importantly as well is later on in the winter, how much standing material still is there because this material becomes those houses for all the pollinators and other insects because all these stems, a lot of them are hollow, creating those homes, as well as creating the structure for other animals that might be living in there. And a lot of all these flower heads still have seed in them that will be collected by birds throughout the fall and into the winter. So adaptive management is another step and that's where we did a lot of work this year. Uh, we didn't start any new sections this year. So we spent a lot of our time doing adaptive management this year. So as I mentioned, we talked about some maintenance mowing, we do some mapping, we deal with invasive species, uh, we do some of the mo buffer mowing and some garbage cleanup as well. Our crew gets out there for the first few weeks of every, every season and we collect garbage throughout the meadow footprint. And this year we collected over 2,700 kilos, 2,700 kilograms of garbage just within the meadow itself. I mean, it's, it's impressive, but it's also kind of sad that there's that much garbage that gets into those areas. And this is something that we would really like to involve the community in more often in doing, you know, community garbage cleanups, uh, because it's a lot of work for our eight people to do. Whereas if you have a large group of, you know, 50 or hundred people that can come out, it can be done much more quickly. Um, so as I mentioned, we do this maintenance mowing and that gets done every three or five years. And the reason we do this is to prevent that thatch layer from building up. So if you leave the meadow just growing, it just gets taller and thicker. And as I showed you in the winter picture, it stays standing, but then it does die off. But that becomes thicker and thicker on the ground. And then suddenly you're not getting the sun contacting with the soil anymore. And what we do want to make sure we still have is the sun to soil uh, exposure so that new seeds have the chance to germinate and small new plants still have the chance to grow. So we do go in with our mower every th about three years or so and that cuts down the standing stock as well as breaking up a lot of that thatch and allows more uh, soil to still get more sun right onto it allowing more space for new plants to come up. We do a lot of mapping uh, and this is a tool called Arc Collector. This is a tool that is part of a geographical information software package that you can actually get on your phone. Uh, so we just walk around with our phones and it looks like we're just texting all day, but we're actually mapping stuff. So if you see a crew out there looking at their phones all day long, they're actually mapping things. They're not just talking to people, at least I hope so. Um, so all of these little dots we see out here, these are spots where we found one specific invasive plant. So we've gone through very carefully, very meticulously and found all the invasive plants so that we can then come back and compare in a year or two or three after we work to remove them to see if we've reduced the number of dots, reduced the, the number of those species. We also have all these other little things that are interesting on here. So we have little birds. Those are the bird boxes. We've got these arrows and that's where we set up permanent photo points so that we can keep taking the photo from the same point over time so that we can then look back and say, well, 
there's that one of the before and the, the after that I just got to show you. Um, we also put in things like dumping because unfortunately some people still dump their debris into the meadow. So sometimes it's things like grass clippings. People will mow their lawn, come out and dump the pile of grass clippings into the meadow. Well, if you've ever tried dumping your grass clippings into your garden plot, the flowers don't really appreciate it. Um, the bigger problem for me is that when they dump those grass clippings, it usually also contains invasive species seeds. So then what ends up happening is where those people are dumping those piles, we tend to have uh, little outcroppings of thistle or DSV that pop up. So it's, it's kind of a process that we just continually are speaking to the landowners, speaking to the property owners and, and explaining that, you know, we don't want to be dumping the grass there. There's other places we can put the, the grass that is perfectly fine, but not into the wildflower meadow areas, preferably. Um, and that being said, a lot of the work we've been doing this year was dealing with invasive species. There is so many invasive species in the Toronto area. I'm sure many of you are familiar with some of the, the five main ones, such as dog strangling vine, uh, Canada thistle, garlic mustard, like this one here, um, spotted knapweed, that's these big plants that are down the bottom right, uh, and European buckthorn, which there's uh, the, the shrubbier trees that have some thorns on them that uh, are very hard to get rid of. So we use uh, specialized best management practices, including manual, we, uh, chemical methods, uh, to try and eradicate as much of these invasive species as we can within the footprint so that we can prevent them from getting a hold and potentially spreading. Um, yep, so dog strangling vine isn't one that we do focus a lot on because it is so prevalent in the Toronto area. So we've tried everything from different cutting techniques, uh, a few different alternative herbicides to tackle it. Um, when we do use herbicides, we're targeting it. So it's very much a spot spray application. So we only uh, apply it to the individual plant. We're not spraying it over large areas uh, and that keeps it completely localized. We also do the buffer mowing. Uh, so we have our crews out there mowing the buffer around the meadow itself. Uh, as I mentioned, we keep that buffer to keep the sight lines along the trails, uh, as well as along property lines. And we do a lot of research as well. Uh, as I said, we like to keep learning as we're going. We like to keep improving our process. Uh, and we do a lot of the research ourselves, but we also partner with the University of Toronto uh, we have three researchers from U of T this year uh, looking at different projects. One is looking at soil hydrology studies where they're doing artificial rainfall simulations and uh, these infiltration rings, that's in the bottom right picture, looking at how the turf compares to the meadow in terms of the way rainfall uh, is incorporated into the soil, whether it flows more quickly into the meadow versus the turf uh, and how much can be absorbed as well. So that's one of the big research projects happening. We've got a bee researcher looking at interactions between different pollinators and which species of flowers are out there. So they're actually creating a map uh, showing which species of flowers are more beneficial to which species of bees. Um, and she's found several, I think she's 30 different genre of bees already out there and cataloged over 800 different species flower interactions. So it's pretty impressive work. Uh, we've got another one looking at DSV pressure and where heavy populations of DSV are as potential invaders into those areas and how much pressure a small patch of DSV can have on another area where if we are allowing bare soil to become present, is that gonna be able to invade it more easily? We also are looking at heat island effect, improving the soil, uh, how it, a flood attenuation happens, and a whole variety of other things that we're always looking at. And I just threw these photos in here because this just happened about a week ago. This was, uh, TRCA just got a new drone. 
so this is our drone on the bottom here. Um, and it's coupled with a, a U of T researcher who does thermal imaging, looking at the effects of different vegetation on heat and how much heat is captured by the ground and how much is heat is released. So these were the very, very first pictures that were taken with this new drone. And this was just done a week ago. And this is a section of meadow. So this circle bit here is actually one of the shrub nodes. And then this is the meadow down on the bottom right. And then these are the, the mowed turf areas along sides of the trail. And then the bottom image is the exact same footprint, but it shows the different heat signature of the area. The trail being bright yellow because it's very, very hot. The mowed turf. And then the meadow and the shrub areas, much, much cooler. In fact, there's a nine degree Celsius difference between the meadow and the mowed grass on this day it was taken. It's, we, I was blown away when they showed us this. Like, oh my gosh, I was expecting like a degree or two, but nine degree difference between mowed grass and the meadow footprint. And also what was, I found really interesting was that the, the tree shrub area shows about the heat, same heat signature as the wildflower meadow. I did not expect the meadow to be as cool as the tree area, but in fact it is. So this is really, really interesting research that's happening right now uh, on sort of the effects of heat, because we know that more urban areas tend to be hotter. So the more natural areas we can introduce will help reduce heat fluctuations and reduce our temperatures overall potentially. So we don't have those super hot, hot, hot days. Um, I know I'm kind of running a little long right now, so I'm going to kind of buzz through the last couple of slides here. So we do a lot of monitoring, as I mentioned. Um, we get our crews out there and look at our monitoring plots. We have definitely looked at uh, all the different grasses, uh, which forbs are coming up. Uh, and they're looking at the plots as they change through time and finding that more and more as the process ages so as the section becomes older it gets more of the native species coming up and so that's something that we're kind of seeing throughout which is a nice thing to see we also have a, a crew that goes out and monitors for birds uh, and this year was really exciting because they found a number of savannah sparrows that were uh, attempting to nest in sections of the meadow pardon me um, and savannah sparrows if you may know our species at risk. So it's nice to see that they're actually getting out and nesting out there. Uh, they all, we also have a butterfly monitoring crew. Uh, one section last year, 200 monarch butterflies were counted in one of the transects, which was unbelievable. Uh, they've been finding 38 different species of butterflies. Uh, rank species, which are some of the more uncommon ones have also been found. Um, and then also lots and lots of other common ones that, like the black swallowtail. And so essentially, at the end of the day, as we have been working with this project, the more we build it, the more things we start to find. Uh, varieties of native bees, more butterflies, more species of butterflies more of the caterpillars getting in there munching on those uh, milkweeds so getting more and more monarchs and so it really is interesting that the the more time we spend out there the more time i get to spend out there the more different species we see the more flowers we see the more insects we see it really is pretty amazing uh, so this is just a little about you know, my personal experience being out there, I get to spend a lot of time talking to residents who live near the corridor, who really are interested in what's happening. They're very excited about what's happening. Um, I get to see the development of these sections because I am there from start to finish on some, a number of them. I've been there from when it was just turf and now I see it two years later and it really is coming in together as a really wild flower meadow and it really is satisfying. Uh, and very exciting to see all that. So what you guys can do, and this is helping me, helping everybody actually in Scarborough, helping everyone in Toronto, and also all those pollinators is be involved as part of the project. 
you know, every, anything from even just going out and visiting it, going for a walk uh, through the trails, go at different times of year, take a look at it because it does change from season to season. So right now, for example, there's a lot more of the tall sunflower out, whereas back um, in July, there was a lot more of the wild bergamot, for example. So you get to see different species depending on the time of year. Um, work together and organize garbage cleanups or planting events. Uh, I know the last two years have been a little bit crazy, but moving forward, things are going to calm down, I hope, and we will start having more events back into the meadow way again, where either yourself or your group as a whole could get together and participate in one of these events. Uh, look at creating your own pollinator gardens. So collecting or buying some native seed, incorporating those into your gardens to try and encourage native pollinators is really important. Uh, I made a note here visiting the resources tab. So I'm referring to there is the metaway.ca website. So if you go to that website and you go to the resources tab, which is this link right here, we have all kinds of resources in there, such as gardening for bees, what kind of things you could do in your gardens to encourage more bees. Or if you're trying to create a butterfly garden, what kind of things will be better for incorporating those butterflies into your gardens? There's also lists of the different species that we have planted in the meadow way. There's some ID keys in there as well. So that helps you identify and see the different species as well. Um, so if you're gonna create your pollinator garden, try and use native species. The, the native pollinators that we have are most adapted to those native species of flowers. So if you're using different cultivars, those wild bees may not be getting the same nutrition even. They may not visit the flowers as much. Uh, and part of that bee research that we have going on, it's also looking at the nectar content and how valuable in terms of carbohydrates and sugars are in that nectar see which flower species really are the bet, better ones for those bees to be visiting. Because the number of cultivars that are used for, for gardening don't have those native um, nectars like the wildflowers do. So although the bees may still visit them, they may not be getting the same nutrition. Um, try and plant a variety of species so you have blooms throughout the growing season, leaving your dead standing stems. Uh, so if you can, leave those stems over the winter rather than clearing your garden out. Because if you do leave it standing there, you're creating that habitat for those um, pollinators. Um, and try and use drought tolerant species. So uh, as I showed you, a lot of our wildflowers have very deep roots. So that means you have to water your garden less. And that's it. Thank you very much. Now, I do have some time if anyone has any questions. I'm, I know I apologize, I do go a little long there, um, but I've got so much information I'd like to share with you all. <laughs> Does anyone have any questions? Uh, I do. Okay, go ahead. Um, uh, you, you referred to form a couple of times. I've never heard that, that term before for your wildflowers. Where does that come from, form? Uh, <laughs> I don't actually know where it comes from, but Forb just basically refers to the wildflower uh, as essentially it's not a grass. It's it's a, a Forb species as a leaf species that produces the flower, essentially. Oh, OK. And the second so question... when you, yeah, sorry. When you say Forb, generally we just refer to wildflower. OK, I have another question, too. I don't live anywhere close to the meadow way. I wouldn't mind going for a walk, but my husband's we're not going to be taking transit up there. I'd have to drive. Is there anywhere, are, is there any spots along it where there are places I could park and then we can, I can wheel them through the meadow? Way? Yeah, there are. And in fact, there's a really good interactive yeah. map on the website that like an accessibility map that shows cool. places where that you can enter into the meadow way. Okay. Um, there's a few places I'd recommend would be down in section four would be at Daventry Road, which is the one of the places where I showed you uh, one of the original overhead shots. Um, you can park on the side of the road there. It's, okay. Um, 
So you can park there or at, um, what's the other one that I recommend? Benshire Avenue. So that's just east of McCowan. So rather than parking on the main roads, if you go and look for cross streets that run between the main roads, so between Macowan oh, okay. and Bellamy, there's a smaller road. And between Markham Road and Scarborough Golf Club, there's a smaller road. So each of those small roads are better options to park on. Okay, great, thanks. You're you welcome. Can also, you can also access it from Thompson Park. Oh. Absolutely. Gabby, oh. you, so if you park in Thompson Park and go down the plane, cross the bridge, you come up to McCowan, and then you can continue all the way over to. Uh, oh, wonderful. Okay. Park. Yep, that's a very good route. It's just a little longer if you're looking for immediate interaction with the flowers. I'd recommend the other ones. That way, though, you got to do a little bit of a walk to get there. Yeah. Oh, okay. All right. Thank you. But it's a good option. All right. Any Chris, other questions? Could I, could I ask you when you mow? I, I witnessed them mowing the 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 meadow way when I was out for a walk one day, and wondered what they were doing. Now you've explained that. Do do they leave the cuttings or do you take them somewhere? No, we leave the cuttings there. Yeah. Um, one of the things we are actually considering is um, pulling up the material uh, and taking some of it away, but we looked at just some some very rough estimates in terms of volume that we'd be pulling out and if we were to bale it for example with like a hay baler mm. one of our sections we would have pulled out over three thousand bales of material <laughs> <laughs> so there's so much biomass there that in order to do that we would have to have somewhere that wanted that material right away because it's just it's huge amounts of volume uh, we are also looking at different mowing methods, different machinery as well that will mulch it up more. Mm. So we did try some some tests this year where we were trying a different uh, style of mower that's more of a mulching mower. So it breaks it into a much, much finer material. So we have less of the stock on the ground. How often do you mow the margins? Uh, the margins around the outside, the buffers, we do every three to four weeks. Yeah. So we try and keep that short, like regular grass turf. Uh, we try not to get it too long. Uh, within the meadow itself, it's about every three years we try and do that mm. once it's established. Mm. Uh, but as it's establishing, sometimes it does need to be mowed more frequently uh, just to make sure that the weeds don't get out of control and make sure that we maintain that sun to soil contact while those plants are starting to establish. Mm. Thank you. You're welcome. Do you have a per hectare cost of uh, developing the uh, metaway and a cost per maintaining it? That's a really good question. And I don't off the top of my head know. Uh, it is not cheap. I'll tell you that mm -hmm. right off the top um, because the seed alone, uh, for example, and the next section we're doing, which is about 17 hectares, is uh, $60,000 worth of seed. So there, there definitely is a, a cost involved in putting these together uh, and getting them established. But once they are established, the, the hope is that the maintenance maintain, moving forward will be much, much more reduced. Uh, but yeah, I don't have a, a number off the top of my head that I can give you. Sorry. Chris, did um, you say that uh, Queen Anne's lace is not a native uh, flower? That's correct. Well, what else is the swallowtails going to eat? There are other um, species that they can also eat. But that said, we don't target removal of the Queen Anne's lace. We just let it grow. Yeah, because that's, uh, that's their best food. For sure, for sure. And we're not going to ever try and eliminate the Queen Anne's lace, but it's not actually one of the ones we plant. So it just oh. is growing by itself. Um, it's not considered an invasive species. So it's not one of the ones that we target to remove, like the dog strangling vine yeah, or know. the Canada thistle. So... Yeah, you, no, it's a good, have, good question. You do have something for the swallowtails to eat. 
because absolutely they're, very, they're, they're they're very specialized in what they will eat absolutely yes yes we do and like i said the queen anne's lace is going to continue to grow there and we're not going to remove it because we know that it is one of the um, species that are required by the butterflies thanks you're welcome Chris, do you have any advice on how we can get rid of dog strangle vine in our own gardens? Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I have some in my own as well that I have to deal with. Um, so if you have a small area that you can manage easily enough, uh, tarping it apparently has been very, very useful for doing that. So sealing it under plastic and essentially burning it, uh, either that or digging it out. So, but if you're going to dig it out, you got to be really careful digging it so that you don't snap the roots off. You need to really dig all the way around the whole root ball and remove all of it. Because if you break off pieces of the root, those can regrow. Uh, the same as if you just cut it off, it can then just regrow from that same root. So it's very difficult. Um, but I would say that digging it out, if you're careful, can be pretty effective. And my other question is, you mentioned you have quite a few volunteers. What kind of jobs do you have or tasks do the volunteers do? Um, well, over the last few years, we have definitely had a reduced number. But uh, in 2019, for example, we had a number of events where volunteers came out and helped with either doing garbage collection or helping remove invasive species. Uh, we had one group that was 150 people. It was a corporate event. The, the whole company came out and we had them down uh, in and around Thompson Park area and they were helping remove all the DSV from all the shrub areas around the outsides, uh, digging that out, uh, as well as collecting all the garbage. They collected something like 85 bags of garbage and 150 bags of, of DSV within one day. So by having a huge number of people like that, you can really really put a big dent into uh, things like that invasive species. Um, we also have events where in the past we've done planting events. So we have some potted stock that come in, uh, in areas that maybe we're struggling a bit and we needed to get more diversity into those areas. We use those as planting beds and uh, volunteers can then help do some of the planting uh, to put those potted stock in as well. What is DSV? Dog strangling, Dog strangling vine. vine. Oh, okay. <laughs> Everyone knows what that is, right? Yeah. <laughs> I have a question. I'm wondering how the Metaway project works with other green spaces to control the spread of invasive species. Um, I was in Thompson Park the other day, and there's a, a lovely stand of Himalayan balsam growing there. And, you know, with the spread by wildlife and stuff. How, how does that work between the conservation area, uh, your, your department and, you know, the parks like Thompson? Right. Well, unfortunately, there's really no way to stop the spreading. Um, if it's being transported by the wind or, or mm -hmm. animals, there's really no way to stop it. But what we do try and do is, as part of our process, we go through and we do that mapping that I showed you at one point, where we do in the spring, we go through and we map areas where we see invasive species. And then throughout that year, we can then come back and try and remove them. Mm. So we do spend a lot of our effort going through and either digging them up, cutting them out, or uh, applying herbicide to spot treatment uh, of those invasive species. So we do try and prevent them from establishing a footprint. So we try and get them as early as we can. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Welcome. Chris, on the website, is there a map of the whole um, Meadowway from start to finish? Because there are gaps at the moment. Yes, there are gaps right now. Um, that's a great question. I would have to look. I know there is an access map for section four, which is the Scarborough, access, the Scarborough Center trail. Uh, I don't know if there is a full map on the website of the other sections because some of them don't have the trail established yet. Yeah. Um, I can tell you in section one and two, which run from the dawn, 
the trail starts at Eglinton and that trail connects all the way through to Kennedy Road. So that section does have a trail through it. We're on and Eglinton. Then, uh, Eglinton, just west of Victoria Park. Okay. Oh yeah, okay. When the, when the high, where the hydro fields down where that car dealership is. That's right. Yep, mm. right where the car dealership is, uh, at the Golden Mile there. So from Eglinton East, there is trail all the way out to Kennedy. Uh, and then we have the section four section of trail, which is from Thompson Park up to Scarborough Golf Club. We're working on Scarborough Golf Club to Nielsen this year, so it's under construction. So is that, uh, that that's the one that they have to cross the valley one because it ends when you cross Scarborough Golf Club, you have to go on the north side of Ellesmere and you go over to Military Trail and then you I don't, you get lost. Yes. Yeah. Because there is no trail there yet. No. <laughs> yeah. So the trail starts right at the corner of Military Trail and uh, Ellesmere on the north side. We'll go down into the ravine. There was a bridge that's being built across the river there. On the and north side will, of Ellesmere? On the north side. Yep. So does that then, they put in that pathway? Yes. They, there's a pathway up from the sidewalk. It was Correct. put in years ago, but I never knew where that went. Yeah, it didn't really go anywhere no. before, but it's going to now. <laughs> okay, oh good, okay. So it Yeah, so that trail is gonna connect to the bridge and okay. then work its way all the way up above onto the plateau up above the, uh, the ravine as well. Okay, thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Um, I just wonder when I drive up Midland Avenue, just south of Lawrence, east and west, there's not much happening yet. Will that be developed eventually? Yes, it will. That is section three. Um, and that's going to run from uh, Brimley on the east all the way down to Kennedy on the west. Um, there's a few issues with that section, uh, as in difficulties, because there is, for one, the uh, LRT and GO train line that runs through there. Oh, yeah. Uh, so I'm not sure how long or if they'll be able to put a bridge over that for the trail or whether the trail will reroute a little bit farther south <laughs> just to make it across the, the, the rail line. And then it will reconnect back up through that section. But that is scheduled to start probably next year on the restoration side of things. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Are there any more questions? I would also like to say a big thank you to our tech man, Raymond, who keeps an eye on our part of the website and it's worked out well today. And uh, I guess if there are no more questions, uh, we can say thank you yes. so much. Sorry, sorry, oh. I thought I saw a couple of questions in the chat oh, okay. for a few minutes. Sure. Oh, okay, let there me check two. the chat. Yeah, there's two questions, one about volunteers and one about right. wood chips. Yes. Okay. Uh, so does one have to have a permit to have volunteers clean up garbage? Um, no, I don't think so. <laughs> uh, I would, if you're going to have an event where you're going to actually go into the Medaway, then just get in contact with us and we can make sure that it's organized um, and can be a, a proper event. But a lot of people have just been doing sort of impromptu events on their own especially over the last year with COVID happening that rather than having it as an official event people would just go out and you know a few people will go out the garbage bag and collect garbage and there's nothing stopping you from doing that at any time um there's another question about laying a wood chip layer on the perimeter so that there'd be no need to mow it um that's an interesting thought I would say that the reason we wouldn't consider that necessarily would be the scale. Um, we're talking about 15 hectares of area. So it's quite a large space um, that we end up mowing. And if we were to try and wood chip 15 hectares of area, we would need uh, probably a few thousand truckloads to be able to cover that. Um, plus once you've mulched it, and put the wood chips down eventually you're going to get weeds coming up through there so uh i think for the time being mowing it is still probably an easier option uh, as much as i hate having to do that mowing myself uh, <laughs> 
it definitely takes a lot of time. Uh, and I got, I got to send a crew out there for a week at a time just to go and cut that grass. Um, but also that's something that, uh, our crew will be doing less of moving forward because most of the mowing around the outsides is actually done by the city of Toronto. So the city of Toronto does that mowing, um, and takes it off of our hands once the, uh, the section has been established. Okay, any other questions in there? I think that's all the ones I saw from the chat. If no one else has any other questions. Well, it looks like uh, we're done. Well, thank you so much, Chris. It's been two years in the making and <laughs> glad you, <find laughs> it. you were able to come. And, Absolutely. Uh, yeah, and uh, I think it's it's since it's an ongoing project, you know, some of us may be in contact with you or whoever else may be on the site, uh, and um, we'll we'll keep, uh, especially now where more and more people have started native and pollinator gardens. And For sure. So this has become a lot more popular too. Absolutely. So again, thank uh, you so much. Thank you're you. very, very welcome. I did just see one last question come in about other groups uh, doing this type of work in the hydro corridors in the GTA. And there are other groups. Uh, in fact, we just had a meeting with the city of Mississauga because they're looking at expanding uh, some work in some of the hydro corridors down in Mississauga. Uh, and Durham region has also been looking at potentially doing some more, uh, in fact, extending beyond the TRCA's jurisdiction for the Meadowway. So moving the corridor farther even east um a lot of this uh a lot of it comes down to where the funding can come from of course so uh if we found lots and lots of money we'd be able to do all 500 of those kilometers running around the trca's jurisdiction <laughs> but uh as it is for now i'm happy with the size we've got um, anyway, I just wanted to thank you all very much for uh, spending some time with me. I really appreciate the opportunity to speak with you all. And uh, I hope you all have a great night and have learned something. Certainly. Thank you so much. You're very welcome. Have a great evening, everyone. You too. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.